Good evening and God bless you. Thank you so much for joining Facebook Live and those of you who may be watching the recording later on. Thank you so much for your time. I pray that tonight's discussion will be a blessing to you and that it will really challenge you to just get in the word and hear what God is saying, not only in the word, but what he is saying to the spirit uh, today in terms of his church. So tonight we're going to talk about the woes of religious elitism the woes of religious elitism. And for those of you that I've not yet had the opportunity to meet, I am Joy Allen of Watch Ministries. Watch means that we are the church and our whole purpose is to remind the body of Christ that we indeed are the body of Christ. We are the church and we as people, we as a body, have a responsibility to the kingdom of God, regardless as to where we worship or who we worship with, we have a kingdom responsibility to lift up the name of Christ and to build the kingdom of God during our time here on earth. So I want to thank you again for your time. I do not take that lightly. I am excited about what is going to be shared on tonight because God is truly speaking to the body of Christ. His spirit is speaking and there is a word that is going forth that requires action on our part. We've got to be doers of the word and not hearers only. So tonight we are talking about the woes of religious elitism. Now before I get started, let's talk a little bit about what elitism is. It's really the belief that a certain group of people have ultimate authority and have special treatment or are entitled to special treatment based on who they are, based on an identity as opposed to their skill or even their knowledge or ability to fulfill that particular need in a body or within a group of people. Elitism is dangerous and unfortunately it has really taken over the local church in many ways and in many areas. It's dangerous because it's almost, it's, it's almost finite, right? There's very little room when you have an elitist society to challenge anyone who is in charge. It's very difficult to correct those who are in charge when correction is needed. And we're beginning to see this in the body of Christ because there is so much of a false teaching that is going forth that is saying that that because a person sits in a position of authority within a local church, they cannot be challenged, they cannot be questioned, they cannot be corrected. And we're going to talk about that on tonight. Elitism is also very dangerous because it leads to nepotism. Nepotism is the belief that a person should assume a position of authority based on their relationships rather than their individual requirements or their individual anointing, uh, their individual giftings, their individual call. And so when we have an idea that a certain people or a certain group of people are elite and have ultimate authority, then we will also easily adopt the idea that anyone who is in good grace with those people also deserves to take a position of leadership or authority. And this type of mindset goes completely against the word of God and what the spirit of the Lord is saying to his church today. We have a lot of people sitting in positions because of who they know. Or we have a lot of people sitting in positions because God called them in 1947, but he hung up the phone in 1985 and they're still sitting there. So we're going to talk about that on tonight. And we're going to talk about the warning that Jesus Christ has given to the church if we don't fix these issues. I'm going to start tonight with a scripture in 1 Corinthians, and I'm reading from the Amplified Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm going to read beginning at verse 27. So I invite you to read and study along. Absolutely. Verse 27 says, now you collectively are Christ's body and individually you are members of it. Each part severally and distinct, each with his own place and function. Everybody has a job. So God has appointed some in the church for his own use. First apostles or special messengers. Second, prophets, inspired preachers and expounders. Third, teachers, then wonder workers, and then those with the ability to heal the sick, helpers, administrators, speakers in different unknown tongues. Are all apostles or special messengers? Are all prophets, inspired interpreters of the will and purposes of God? Are all teachers? Do all have the power of performing miracles? Do all possess extraordinary powers of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? but earnestly desire and zealously cultivate the greatest and best gifts and graces, the higher gifts and the choicest graces. And yet I will show you a still more excellent way, one that is better by far and the highest of them all. 
which is love. I want to start out by this by sharing this scripture because we have to be careful and understand that God has set in place order. Order is needed. God does everything decently and in order. He is not the author of confusion. Now, that being said, even within the body of Christ, he has called leaders. He has called visionaries. He has called people to specific jobs and roles that we must complete in order for the body to work together, fitly joined. That being said, even the leaders must understand and we must understand that just because a person is a leader does not mean that anyone who is not is unnecessary. We are all still a part of the body. And when scripture talks about how God has placed first apostles and secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, for example, we're not saying that apostles are most important, that prophets are most important after that, that teachers are most important after that. That's not at all what the scripture is saying. If I can give you an example of a home being built, we understand that first, the foundation, God bless you, Cynthia, thank you for joining. We understand that when we build a house first, the foundation is built. Then there's a frame. After the frame goes up, we put up walls. We come in with the interior uh, things that we need to put in. We put in floors, we paint, we add all types of things and we put the roof on the top. And at some point, an interior decorator comes in and brings in the furniture and makes everything pretty and warm. That's how we build a house in a nutshell. Now, first I said, we lay the concrete. First, we lay the, the foundation. Does that mean that after the foundation is laid, nothing else matters? Absolutely not. The walls are still needed. The frame is still needed. The air conditioning is still needed. The wiring is still needed. All of those things have a part and have a purpose. The problem in the body of Christ is that too many of us are being told that the apostle is the end all. No. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of the church. He is the piece that is absolutely necessary and has all authority. After that, every other piece is needed. Yes, we all have different roles, and sometimes those roles include leadership responsibilities, but what they do not include is an ultimate power to change the will, the heart, and the purpose of God. His church has a purpose already. And it is our job, all of our job, regardless of position, regardless of title and regardless of grace, to fulfill that mission here in the earth, to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ and to build the kingdom of God. There are woes to spiritual or religious elitism. There are issues when we begin to teach that because a person fulfills a certain position, that they are more important to God and to others than another. That is a false doctrine. It is a cancer in the local church that has taken over seemingly, and we have got to correct it. We're going to go to the word of God and see what Jesus had to say. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 23. And I'm going to try my best to work through this scripture on tonight. I, again, I want to encourage you to grab your word, to study along, to read along. And even after you have viewed this broadcast and this video, please go back and pray. Ask God to give you insight. Ask God to give you revelation to make sure that you're not falling into a mindset that is elitism. It's very, very dangerous. Matthew chapter 23, and again, I'm reading out of the Amplified Version. I'm just going to take my time on tonight, so bear with me. Beginning right at verse 1, it says, Jesus said to the multitude and to his disciples, the scribes and Pharisees sit on Moses' seat of authority. Now, let me just stop right there for one moment. Jesus starts out by acknowledging that there are certain people based on Jewish law and tradition that have a position of authority. So as I said, we're talking against elitism. That does not mean that we're speaking against leadership and it does not mean we are speaking against order. But even in that position of authority, there is a very strong and strict level of responsibility that people must be held accountable to. Being in a position of leadership, being called of God, does not give us a green card to do whatever we want to do to treat people any way, and we're going to talk about that. So the first point, Yes, there are certain people who are called to a certain place. God has given them a grace, an anointing, and an assignment. And Jesus acknowledges that, so should, so should we. Excuse me. Verse 3 said, So observe and practice all they tell you, but 
Do not do what they do for they preach, but they do not practice. Herein is our first warning. We as the body of Christ have got to be doers of the word. We've got to stop preaching things that we are not doing ourselves. Now I'm going to ruffle some feathers tonight for the sake of example, to make sure that we are all on the same page and that there's a very clear understanding. It is wrong to preach that people should give their last when we ourselves refuse to give our last. It is wrong to preach that wives should be submissive to their husbands when we, as the female leaders, are pending divorce because we refuse to submit to our own husbands. There is so much hypocrisy in the body of Christ that we must immediately stamp out. If we are preaching it, we must do it. We should be examples. We should not be saying things that we ourselves fail to practice. That is the first thing that Jesus condemns right here in verse three. Then in verse four, he says, they tie up heavy loads, hard to bear and place them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not lift a finger to help bear them. People of God, beware of people, leaders, fellow believers, who will put responsibility on you for things that are almost impossible. Beware of people who, in order to try and prove their anointing, their power, or whatever, will do all kinds of strange, crazy things and demand that you walk in faith when they themselves can't get past doubt. We've got to be careful about this because these leaders, as Jesus pointed out, they came up with impossible tasks for people and held them responsible when they themselves were not willing to do even the simple things. Not even the simple things. You've got to beware of those leaders who will tell you, no, bring your money to the church and believe God for your rent when they're living in a home where they've never missed a bill. This is real talk. This is Straight Talk with Joy Allen, and we're going to talk about it the way that it is. I can't tell you during my 10 years as a pastor how many phone calls I took from people who attended mega churches, who were giving money to leaders who were living in multi-million dollar homes and driving luxury cars, yet they would call our little church and ask for help with their bills all the time, every single month without fail. And when we would ask them what happened to your money, well, I had to pay my tithes. I had to take care of the man or the woman of God. Yet then we asked them, well, how, how come you can't go to your church and get some help? Well, I don't want to be a bother. That's not the body of Christ. The body of Christ is a family. It's a family. So we've got to be careful not to put things on others that we're not willing to take on ourselves. Verse five, they do all their works to be seen of men. For they make wide their phylacteries, which were small cases in closing certain scripture passages worn during prayer on the left arm and the forehead in Jewish tradition. And they make long their fringes worn by all male Israelites according to the command. Let me pause here for a moment. I'm going to say this. I pray it doesn't make people mad, but it's the truth anyway. Go and do your research. We have a lot of people floating around here just to be seen. Can you explain to me, man of God, woman of God, why do you have to go to Cracker Barrel with your white collar on? <laughs> why do you have to parade around town with your preaching robe on? That is the same spirit, that spirit of pride that says, I must be distinguished from everybody else. I don't want to be a part of the family. I've got to look different. I've got to be important. I've got to make sure everybody knows who I am. Everybody must understand that I am in charge. Jesus, he ridicules that here. He ridicules it. And to be quite honest with you, many of us who say that we are non-denominational, we are spirit led, or we are, you know, we're, we're men and women of God. We don't fool with all kinds of crazy religious things. You'd be surprised. Look at all of your regalia and go and look up where it came from. Most of it came through the Catholic church. It has nothing to do with Jewish tradition. It has nothing to do with scripture. It has nothing to do with even the old priestly garments. A lot of this stuff that we're wearing, it, it's birthed in paganism and we're still doing it. We have four and five hour services just to confirm that God has called somebody. You're putting on all kinds of stuff that you can't afford, much less even pronunciate. Why? We're doing it because we like to feel special. 
But that is not what ministry is about. That is not what leadership is about. It's about being a part of the team. And let me tell you something. Even if you study war and you study battle strategy, you will come to understand that those who were in charge, the generals didn't look any different. <laughs> when you're on the battlefield, you want to look the same. Why? Because if the enemy can find who the leader is, guess who he's going to take out first. Some of us need to check our egos and realize that we are part of a team. We are part of a family. We are the part of the kingdom of God, but we are not the end all ourselves. Why do we need to be distinguished? Why am I embarrassed or ashamed to look like my brothers and sisters in Christ? That's something that we need to reconcile within ourselves. Moving along, verse six, it says, and they take pleasure in and thus love the place of honor at feast and the best seats in the synagogue. Ah, <laughs> we love to have our names called, right? Jesus is still talking about this need, this ego and the need to feed that ego. We've got to be careful about that in leadership when it comes to the body of Christ. It is not about our ego. Don't be offended because you weren't invited to sit on the front pew. What does it matter? I never understood how even in the church, we're supposed to be the people of God. We're supposed to be sensitive and compassionate. It amazes me how very abled, quote unquote, men of God will take up all the front seats and all the seats of honor. But you might have a little old woman sitting over here who's been faithful in that ministry, who knows how to pray, who loves God, who needs that seat but she doesn't have on a collar. She's not dressed like a penguin today. I'm not trying to be facetious and mean. I'm trying to get us to think. We've got to get out of this mindset that because I am in a certain position, I deserve to be treated differently. That is not scripture. Let's look at the example that Jesus gave. We're talking about the son of God. We're talking about the savior of the world, yet he always, and I do repeat always, took the position of lowliness. We must follow suit. Let's continue reading. Verse seven says, and they also like to be greeted with honor in the marketplaces and to have people call them rabbi. But you are not to be called rabbi or teacher for you have one teacher and you are all brothers and do not call anyone in the church or on earth father for you have one father who is in heaven. I've got to pause here for a moment because we are so addicted to titles. <laughs> oh my goodness. Now, let me say this. I have no problem acknowledging people for who they are, whether you are talking about a secular arena or a religious one. If a person has studied in school and they are an MD, I will call them doctor. Okay. If a person is an elderly person compared to myself, I will say, yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. If they are married, I'll call them Mrs. Or I'll call them Mr. I have no problem with those types of titles as a form of respect in the church. I have no problem with it either. If God has confirmed you to be a pastor or a teacher, I have no problem talking to you and, and basically acknowledging you as such. However, we've got to go back to scripture. Scripture says you don't call anybody on earth your father because it's basically disrespectful to our heavenly father. All this craziness about this one being my spiritual mother, my spiritual father, we've got to stop that because what we've done is we have taken a scripture about Timothy completely out of context and created a false doctrine around it. You don't need to be birthed again. You've already been born again. You don't need another mediator. The scriptures say that there's only one mediator between God and man, and that is Jesus Christ. That is it. We got to stop all of this. What it's doing, it's selling t-shirts, absolutely. It's selling messages, absolutely. But it is false doctrine, people of God. Scripture is clear. Jesus says, don't call anybody a teacher. Don't call anybody a father. These titles, especially titles that are demanded, out of order completely. What's wrong with sister and brother? That's what we are. We are joint heirs with Christ. We have been adopted into the family of God. Ah, and praise God, because of the spirit of adoption, we can cry, Abba, Father, hallelujah. What's wrong with brother and sister? 
Yes, we can acknowledge that you have been called and ordained to do an apostolic work. We can acknowledge that you are called and ordained to do a prophetic work, but that is not your name. What did your mother name you? That is your name. <laughs> but again, elitism. Elitism says I've got to be separated from the group. I want people to acknowledge me as being special. I've got to feed my ego in the name of the Lord. We have to be careful. It is elitism. He says, he being Jesus says, you're all brothers. I'm going to tell you the greatest thing that anybody can call me in terms of a title is sister joy. To acknowledge that we belong to the same family, that we have the same heavenly father. <laughs> and to acknowledge that my mom and daddy gave me a name. Thank you. Joy is absolutely fine. That's what God calls me. He might say, you are my prophet or I'm giving you an, a, a prophetic assignment. But come on. I would hope that our worship is intimate enough that we are not on title levels with God, but that he can call us by our first name. Amen. Praise God. Verse 10. You must not be called masters or leaders for you have one master or leader, the Christ. Going along the same lines. Verse 11. He who is greatest among you shall be your servant. I've got to pause one more time at verse 11. The greatest among us are servants. We say that we get it, but do we really practice it? I need to understand this whole armor bearer culture because again, I'm not going to get into a teaching on armor bearers tonight, but that's one that I might have to do because it's based on so much false doctrine, so much false doctrine that again feeds elitism. But let's talk just a moment about that scenario that so many of us have seen. If indeed the leader is the greatest and if indeed the leader is the one that has been called of God and the one who hears God and the one who has this great assignment, why is it that someone else who is usually a new believer is the one who's carrying their water, carrying their Bible, doing everything that they say? I'm confused because the greatest should be the servant. So it's that pastor, that apostle who should be serving everybody else water. I mean, I'm just saying. Jesus, as great as he was, he did not have his apostles serving him. Scripture said he came and washed their feet. We've got this thing backwards. We must beware of anyone who demands to be served but refuses to serve. And we as leaders must be very careful that we never find ourselves in a position where we expect people to serve us. If you need it done, do it yourself and then do it for somebody else. That's what makes you great. Ah, glory to God. Verse 12. Whoever exalts himself with haughtiness and empty pride shall be humbled or brought low. And whoever humbles himself, whoever has a modest opinion of himself and behaves accordingly, he shall be raised in honor. I believe that speaks for itself. God is not a liar. His word is not going to come back void. Everything that he says, it shall be. So we need to take heed. But woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, and if I may, modern day leaders, especially in the American church, pretenders, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in men's faces, for you neither enter yourselves, nor do you allow those who are about to go in to do so. I've got to share something. Some of you know uh, that a few years ago, I think two or three years ago, I wrote a very controversial book. And that book was called The Truth About Tithes and Offerings. It was a, a, basically a book about spiritual giving. And when I wrote and released that book, I knew that I needed to be cautious. I did receive some crazy threats and that kind of thing. But let me tell you the thing that offended me the most. I actually had lots of colleagues, if I can use that word, in ministry, read the book and give me their honest opinion. Not one leader, pastor, apostle, or otherwise said that they disagreed with the premises, which basically talked about the history of tithing and how today, while the tithing is, is a, a, a plumb line, if you will, for us in terms of what kind of giver we are, we are supposed to be free will givers. Not one person in a position of leadership who read that book disagreed with the premise. But many of them said to me, Joy, even though I agree, I will never teach it because then people won't give. They admitted that the doctrines being taught are false, 
but refused to change them because they were afraid they would not get the results they were looking for. That is what Jesus is rebuking these scribes and Pharisees for. He's basically saying, you know better. You're not doing better yourself, and therefore, you're not even going to help somebody else get into heaven. We have got to be careful that we are not tripping other people up simply because we don't feel like doing right. We've got to stop manipulating the word of God to try to get a result out of people. That is witchcraft. It is dangerous, and God just simply doesn't like it. We got to be careful, people of God. Jesus says to them, you shut out the kingdom of heaven and you're not even trying to get in yourself. You're not even trying to live holy yourself. But you're telling other people lies. You're giving them excuses. We cannot be caught in that position. Verse 14 says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, pretenders, hypocrites, for you swallow up widows' houses and for a pretense to cover it up, make long prayers. Therefore, you will receive the greater condemnation and the heavier sentence. Stop taking advantage of people. You know good and well that they don't have any money. Stop telling them that God said to give your last when he has not spoken anything to you. Stop it. Stop taking what belongs to other people. Come on, people of God, you know, you live in America, you've seen TV, you read the news, you've been to a church lately. How many times are we going to see these quote unquote great men of God divorce their wives, marry the person they were sleeping with, <laughs> and then preach about divorce? And we act like it's okay. We act like it's okay that Bishop so-and-so is on wife number five. We act like it's okay that the church can't have a first lady if we even believed in that because now they have a fourth lady. We've got to stop this madness because we know better. This is not ignorance. This is disobedience and disobedience is as the sin of witchcraft. It will be punished as such. We've got to stop it. What allows people to do it is again, ego and elitism. They feel like they deserve it. We've got to stop. Verse 15, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, pretenders, hypocrites, for you travel over sea and land to make a single proselyte. And when he becomes one or a proselyte, you make him doubly as much a child of hell as you are. <laughs> we got to stop traveling and going around trying to find people that look like us. Really, we're supposed to be creating disciples of Jesus Christ, but so many of us are in ministry just to create our own disciples. We want people to look like us. We want them to sound like us, to act like us. And whatever they accomplish, we want to make sure that they give us credit for teaching them. That we want to make sure they give us credit for nurturing them, for building them up. No, that is your job. I tell you, there are so many leaders in the churches today worse than deadbeat fathers. I mean, going to a person because they are successful in life and saying, hey, I prayed for you. I raised you up, so to speak. I taught you things in the scripture. And because of that, you're supposed to take care of me. That's like a deadbeat dad who comes and visits their child on one Saturday and says, oh, by the way, <laughs> I want you to buy the diapers and I want you to make the bag and I want you to do all this stuff because I came and spent time with my child. No, that is your job. That's your calling. God awards you for that. We got to stop it because when we create disciples for ourselves, they become double the hellions that we are. We were never called to make disciples for ourselves. We were called to make disciples for Jesus Christ, to teach people to be Christ-like. I'm not supposed to teach anybody to be joy-like. I'm supposed to teach people to be Christ-like. Now, if they follow me as I follow Christ, there may be some things they pick up, but it's not about being like your leader. It's about using what your leader can give you to become more like Christ, Christ-centered. You're supposed to be like the Messiah. Verse 16, woe to you blind guides who say, if anyone swears by the sanctuary of the temple, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the sanctuary, he's a debtor bound by his oath. We gotta be careful about making stuff more important than God. 
Ah, oh, come on. We're all familiar with all of these finance doctrines and prosperity messages. We have made stuff more than God. We've told people that if you don't have a big house and a car, that you lack faith. We told people that if you're not married by a certain age, then you're not favored of God. Lies, lies, lies. Stuff and our position in this life is never more important than the things of God. The things that God has called holy, they are holy. And we've got to get our focus back. Verse 17, you blind fools. For which is greater, the gold or the sanctuary of the temple that has made the gold sacred? You say too, whoever swears by the altar is not duty bound, but whoever swears by the offering on the altar, his oath is binding. I'm not going to get into a tithing discussion tonight, but if you could just think for a moment, how many people will tell you that if you would just pay your tithes, God will open up the windows of heaven. Haven't said anything about repentance. Haven't said anything about worship or building a relationship with the father. Yahweh doesn't matter as long as you drop that check in the bucket and you bless the priest the man of God or the woman of God. We have completely just jacked up priorities in many cases. God is not pleased with that. It's the same thing that Jesus is condemning in verse 18. When he says, you tell them if they swear by the altar, it doesn't matter. But if you swear by the offering, all of a sudden it's binding. So no matter how we live, as soon as we give, God is somehow obligated to bless us. Let's get back to our word, people of God. Let's get back to personal relationship with God and he'll correct some of this craziness for us. Verse 19, you blind men, which is greater, the gift of the altar, which makes the gift sacred. So whoever swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And he who swears by the sanctuary, the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And whoever swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, pretenders and hypocrites, for you give a tenth of your mint and dill and cumin and have neglected and omitted the weightier, more important matters of the law, right and justice and mercy and fidelity. These you ought particularly to have done without neglecting the others. Yes, giving is one piece of ministry and it is important. We give because God commands us to give. But there are so many other things that are just as important. We've got to be careful to keep our priorities in order. It's so easy to ignore the weightier things. And so many times that's what happens. And that's why we continue to look over sin in our lives because we go to church to be entertained in many cases. We go for someone to pat us on the back and make us feel good about ourselves instead of hearing the truth. The truth will make us free, but the truth also brings us to repentance. And it is that, that prospect of repentance that scares many of us. It's the process that we must go through to be sanctified and cleaned up for the Father's use. It scares and intimidates many of us. But that's what is required for eternal life. That is what is required to have a life where the Holy Spirit operates in you and where God can truly use you and get the glory. It's necessary. Verse 24, you blind guides, filtering out a gnat and gulping down a camel, <laughs> making mountains out of molehills, so to speak. Can I just use this as an example? Because I've actually been guilty of this. Many of these things we're talking about tonight, let me tell you, I have been in circles with some very influential people. I'm not going to name drop tonight, but I'm sure many of the pastors and preachers that you have known of, at least, who have been on national platforms, I've had opportunities to sit in rooms with them when they conducted training or to sit in rooms with them when they were being trained. And you would be absolutely surprised at some of the mess that we at that time were taught as leaders in the local church. It's, it's amazing. It's amazing. And we were taught, quite frankly, to condemn people when they miss a Sunday. It took God to rebuke me so that I would stop rebuking people when they took off a Sunday to spend time with their family or took off a Wednesday night Bible study so they could go to their child's football game. We lived, I lived, I should say, so condemned for things so long and God had to restructure my priorities and say, wait a minute, you are called first as a wife and a mother. 
We have got to be careful because many of us are condemning people for doing things and it's just religious elitism. They're not in sin. In fact, they're doing what some of us should have done. We wonder why our marriages are falling apart. Instead of spending all night at prayer every weekend, spend some time with your husband, spend some time with your wife. <laughs> we'll roll around on the floor with strangers speaking in tongues haven't spent any time rolling around with your spouse in the last five years. Priorities are off people of God. And there's no reason except religion because God has not required any of this from us. It's elitism. It's leadership that has spilled into church, some purposefully and some just by accident and tradition, not saying that everyone even knows but when you do know better, you do better. Why scripture says to him that knows to do good and does it not to him, it is sin. So when we know better, we are held accountable to do better and to preach that others do better as well. Verse 25, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you pretenders and hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but within they are full of extortion. They pray, spoil and plunder and grasping self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and of the plate so that the outside may be clean also. We all know how to clean up for church. We all know how to put a smile on our face and act like everything is great. We all know how to give what I used to call the Baptist hug. <laughs> you know, we know how to act like everything is perfect. We know how to, you know, just act like we, we're getting along with our spouse. We're getting along with our children. Everything is great. Our credit is good. Our bills are paid. It is a lie. If you go back to James chapter five, there are some promises that are made there if we would be vulnerable and faithful and believe God. Scripture says not only when we're sick should we go to the elders, but he says if there's any sin found in you, if you would confess your faults one to another, then the elders can pray and you will be forgiven. People of God, that is powerful. If you don't believe me, go back and read James chapter five. It is right there. It is right there. But the problem is we have been conditioned to cover up so much. And that's why we go to church or go to fellowship or whatever you want to call it. When you come together in an assembly, you go broken and hurt and disgusted and angry and you leave the exact same way. It's because you don't have enough faith in your God to cover you when you are vulnerable and follow his word. Scripture is very clear. If you confess then prayer can go forth and your sins will be forgiven you. I used to tell people all the time, we got this thing backwards. Because scripture says when we go into the world, we're supposed to be the salt and light. But truthfully, many of us as believers, when we go into the world, that's when we act like we're crazy. We're rude to people. We don't tip at restaurants. <laughs> we roll our eyes. We beep our horn in traffic. We're irritated all the time. We don't speak to anybody. We don't show love to our neighbor. And then we come to church and put on the fake face. I need you to flip that. I need you to flip it. I'm not saying to be fake, but what I am saying is that when you go out into the world, that's when you're supposed to be different. That's when you're supposed to be salty. That's when you're supposed to be light. That's when you're supposed to bring something to others. When you come into the church, that's when you're supposed to be naked before God. When you come into an assembly and fellowship, that's when you're supposed to be vulnerable so that we can help each other and edify one another so we can actually heal and grow. That scripture, we got to get back to it. And I'm just going to throw this out here. If you are in fellowship with people that you can't trust with your vulnerability, then you're fellowshipping with the wrong people. Period. End of story. Selah. Verse 27. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, pretenders and hypocrites, for you are like tombs that have been whitewashed, which look beautiful on the outside, but inside are full of dead men's bones and everything impure. Just so you also outwardly seem to people to be just and upright, but inside you are full of pretense and lawlessness and inquiry or iniquity, excuse me. We've got to be careful. It's not worth the people of God. Jesus said, listen, on that day, there will be people who said, I prophesied in your name. I performed miracles in your name. To, for Jesus to then look at you after you've done all that and say, I know you not, it's not worth it to impress people. People, come on, are not that important beside God. It's not worth it. We've got to take off this facade. I tell people all the time, nobody can be you like you, boo. 
Be the best you you can be. God has ordained and created you for just that. Nobody else can do it. Be proud of who you are, but at the same time, allow God to perfect you. He can't perfect what you're hiding. Many of us don't know who we are ourselves. And I would venture out to say, because it happened to me, a lot of that false stuff that we put on, we were taught in the church. It's time out for that now. God is calling us to something higher. He's calling us to a greater identity. He's calling us to be authentic. And when we are authentically who he has called and created us to be, then he can use us. He can make us great. And let me tell you, when you're not so concentrated on keeping a face, <laughs> then God can do something with you because he knows that he doesn't have to worry about you being just preoccupied with your own image. It's important. It's part of humility. Verse 30, saying, I'm sorry, verse 29, woe to you scribes and Pharisees, pretenders and hypocrites, for you build tombs for the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous, saying, if we had lived in the days of our forefathers, we would not have aided them in shedding the blood of the prophets. Thus you are testifying against yourselves that you are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then and measure of your father's sins to the brim so that nothing may be wanting to a full measure. You serpents, you spawn of vipers. How can you escape the penalty to be suffered in hell or Gehenna? Let me just pause here for a moment. Many of us talk about the old days. I wouldn't have done this. I wouldn't have done that. Let me just caution all of us on that. We can say, hey, I don't understand Judas. It wouldn't have been me. <laughs> But many of us, we can't even stand for Christ at our job. Some of us won't even stand for Christ at our own family reunion. So we've got to be careful. We've just got to be careful about what we say and judging others, especially those who have suffered for the cause of Christ in whatever capacity. We got to stop judging each other when we have different testimonies. We don't know what someone else has gone through. Certainly sometimes God will reveal bits and pieces so that we can encourage one another. But we are doing way too much comparison to other people when we are supposed to be like Christ. Who cares if you're more righteous than your, than your, your neighbor? Who cares? We've been called to be like Christ, period. So we got to be careful about our mouths and condemning others just to make us feel better. Verse 34, because of this, take notice, I am sending you prophets and wise men, interpreters and teachers and scribes, men who are learned in the Mosaic law and the prophets. Some of them you will kill, even crucify, and some you will flog in your synagogues and pursue and persecute from town to town, so that upon your heads may come all the blood of the righteous, those who correspond to the divine standard of right. Shed on earth from the blood of the righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar of burnt offering. Truly I declare unto you, all these evil and calamitous times will come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, murdering the prophets and stoning those who, who are sent to you. How often would I have gathered your children together as a mother fowl gathers her brood under her wings and you refused. Behold, your house is forsaken and desolate. It's abandoned and left destitute of God's help. For I declare to you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed, magnified in worship, adored and exalted is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus said to those Pharisees and scribes, just as he is speaking to the church today, many who consider themselves to be the elite would be the very ones to kill those that God has truly called. We see it every day, maybe not in the physical, maybe not in the natural, we don't see that shedding of blood, but we do see many people who are being abused. We see many people who are being discouraged. We see people's names who are being slandered, not because they're not called, not because they aren't anointed, not even because they aren't preaching the truth, but simply because they didn't do things the way one leader thought they should. That is a tool of witchcraft. These are the woes of religious elitism. This is what happens when we begin to think that we are better than somebody else. And I just want to encourage all of us here in the body of Christ. Number one, crucify that elitist mindset if you have any iota of such. Pray and get rid of it. Number two, stop feeding the egos of those who do have it. Just like the world, the local church has something in common. 
It operates on supply and demand. Imagine what would happen if true believers stop supporting these organizations that have crazy people in positions of authority. It would stop, but we continue to get sucked in. Why? Because we like it. We also have an elitist mindset. We're afraid to speak against what's wrong because somebody told us out of context, <laughs> touch not mine anointed, do my prophet no harm. Not everybody who's speaking is God's called. Not everybody who's teaching or even trying to prophesy is God's prophet. In fact, he told us, you will know them by their fruit. Too many of us are operating in a spirit of fear that is the direct result of religious manipulation. I'm not saying that we should be rebellious people, but I am saying that we need to be a people who are ready for a revolution. We are revolutionary because God has called and ordained us to be. We are a chosen generation because God has called and ordained us to be. We must operate as such. The world is waiting on the manifestation. That is the visibility of the sons of God. Scripture says that a people who know their God, they will be strong and do exploits. But many of us are stagnant because of fear. And that fear is rooted and grounded in religious doctrine that goes against the word of God. We have esteemed the tradition of men above the word of God. And we should understand that that time and season is over. Come on, people of God, you have Google. Many of you have 4,000 versions of scripture. You can study, you can read, and even more, you can pray, you can fast, you can worship, and you can hear the voice of God. It is time for the body of Christ to stand up and operate as just that, a body that is fitly joined together where everybody understands they have a part. Everybody has a part. If you are called, if you are born again, you have a part and your part is needed. Your part is not to sit on a bench week after week after week and do nothing until your leader snaps their fingers. That is not your part. I know that what I'm talking about tonight is not popular. I know that this probably doesn't cl classify as a, a, a scripture or a teaching or a message, whatever you wanna call it, but it is the truth. And I challenge you on tonight to please get in your prayer closet. I'm not asking you to take my word for it. I'm asking you to seek God and find your place and fellowship with people who will push you to fulfill your God-ordained destiny as opposed to being lackadaisical and just waiting for God to do something else in your life. There's so much more than what we know, so much more than what we've done. And there's a whole world out here that needs to know God. Let's make that our priority, that he will be pleased. Woe to you scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. Come on, people of God. We're a family. We can do this because God has sent us. He has empowered us. He has called us, and we shall be victorious. We are overcomers in him. God bless you on tonight. Thank you so much for your time. I hope to see or speak with you virtually very soon. God bless you all. Love you, and have a wonderful evening.